Hi, this is Carol Szynski uh, talking to y'all from the Somerset Historical Society in Somerset, Texas. Tonight at our meeting, which we hold once a month, we have special guests. They are from a group called Voices Cosmicas. And if I'm correct, that stands for Cosmic Voices. Voices Cosmicas, Cosmic Voices. Very good. And our guest tonight uh, and poets are going to be Alicia Zavala and Jacinto Cardona. That's correct. And I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for the uh, opportunity, the invitation to share our poetry uh, with you this afternoon. Well, I was born in Palacios, Texas. Anyone know from where Palacios is? Palacios, Texas? Yeah. yeah, it's a little shrimping town, and it's uh, north of Houston. I was born there, but uh, my mom was afraid of hurricanes, so she told my dad uh, we need to go to your hometown, and he was from Alice. And so I grew up in Alice, but I was born in Palacios, Texas. I have a book out called Pan Dulce, which is Mexican sweet bread, and it's out of print. And, uh, but what I did, and what I have for you today, uh, that I'm going to share with you, uh, I made a little homemade uh, uh, book, little book for you, so that you'll have something. And you'll see, the, you'll, I'll, I'll read the poems, and uh, they're in here. So I have uh, one for everyone. I teach school at Incarnate Word High School, uh, uh, teach English and uh, create, uh, creative writing. I've been there since 2001. I retired from public schools. Uh, I started teaching in 1966, so that makes me about 79. <laughs> so I walk in history. Um, and this is a billboard that Alice uh, put up. I, I forget what year it was, but I loved it because it was it was so much what a little town is all about. They want to make sure that they are considered to be in America. Because <laughs> I always say, well, how come they didn't say Alice, Texas? It just says, it says Alice, America. So they're very proud. Small towns, as you know, are very proud and have a rich history. And so I, I'm glad I took the picture because it's no longer there. And uh, I forget what year it was when they put that up. Uh, and that's where I grew up. And then I went to uh, Texas a and I College. Uh, it, it wasn't part of A&M. Actually, AI uh, College, College of Arts and Industries. Mm -hmm. Now it's part of AM. That's in Kingsville, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I went there because it was only 28 miles away from Alice. <laughs> I'm a real proud of okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, <clears throat> initially, I wasn't going to go to college. I was right there from high school, get a job, that sort of thing. Uh, but I wound up going, going there. I want to read for you. <clears throat> At the wheel of a blue Chevrolet, that's the first poem. I'm not at the wheel of a blue Chevrolet on my way to Lisbon. In fact, I'm on Highway 281 on a two-lane blacktop between George West and the next stop, the hub of South Texas. The blur of barbed wire makes me think of how I take the X in Tex, the X in Mex, and how I add for good measure the humble eggs my mother used to make. My bones contemplate the palimpsest of eggs after dusty eggs by sounds make across caliche pits. No, I'm not at the wheel of a blue Chevrolet on my way to Lisbon. In fact, I'm on Highway 281 on a two-lane blacktop between George West and the next stop, the hub of South Texas Alice, America. There was a little sign that they would put up um, because of cor Corpus, the West of Us, a bigger city, well, it's a city, I was just a little town, and they had the um, audacity, the verb, the nerve, uh, to make a sign that about seven miles before you got to Abadulce, uh, there was a big sign with a big arrow making a U-turn saying, are you sure? You couldn't find it in Alice. That's a small conference. Yeah, they didn't have Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so I just love that attitude. And of course, I, I grew up there. We are infamous for Box 13, a uh, historical moment when LBJ got his nickname, Landslide, 
because the landslide of dead people voted for him. <laughs> uh, and that's the infamous Box 13. So we're very rich in history, good and bad and ugly, just like every town. Uh, and that's, uh, that was my elementary, that was Springsteen, uh, Box 13, and he was very proud of that. Um, he used to have a picture uh, of, um, uh, in his office of um, these three guys uh, holding, um, in those days, uh, the voting was done in metal canisters, canvas, and, and they're holding, uh, and it says Box 13. Uh, and he would just slap his knee and say, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, a wonderful, um, amazing scholarly work, and uh, it's four volumes of uh, the official biographer, Mr. Robert Carroll. I mean, uh, it's just, you learn so much. Coke Stevenson, all those uh, names and politicians from that time. This is my uh, essay on Tex Mex. Uh, I want to explain the X, in, uh, or just give you a note about the X and uh, the humble X my mother used to make. My mom was illiterate, uh, and uh, a lot of times when I would say that she did not know how to read or write, they, they, they assumed she spoke Spanish, she could write in Spanish. And so, no, no, she, she doesn't know uh, how to write, period. Uh, yeah, so who's going to sign for her? I, I do. She would write an X, and then I would sign it. And then I told my dad, Dad, Mom, uh, I want to teach Mom how to, how to write. And so. She said, yeah, so she, she went into her, and she, I taught her how to write her name. And then I said, uh, Dad, um, uh, well, actually, I didn't tell him later. I had to explain myself. Uh, I told Mom, you know, Mom, you need to practice. Get a credit card. Uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the nurse to my dad, right? And uh, so she said, oh, pues que bueno, see, si. uh, we got one from Dillard's. And then she went to town, but I had to explain to the clerks uh, that they should take care of other people that were behind, you know, waiting, because uh, can you imagine the, the, the power, uh, the thrill, uh, the awesomeness of a person who did not know, was it totally illiterate, and now could write her name. And so she took pride in every sweet letter that she would write, every dot. Her name was... Uh, Eloisa Rodriguez Cardona. And I said, Ma, you can just write E, E, C, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. Eloisa <laughs> Rodriguez de Cardona. So, okay, Ma, but, you know, I gotta tell them, you know. And so, yeah, so it was a lot of fun, but the laughter died when my dad said, You come in. But, pues que es esto? Dealers keep, you know. <laughs> Mom's learning how to sign her name, and of course, I was persona non grata. He, he knew very little. I grew up in a household where uh, the parents were, uh, they didn't go to school or anything. He, he, he was very fond, he had a sense of humor, that's where I get my humor from, um, that uh, he was in third grade and he had to drop out. And I said, well, why don't you have to drop out then? Well, I was 15. Oh. <laughs> you were 15 years old then? Yeah. Oh, okay. So he didn't graduate, so he was a fry cook. Uh, that's my essay on Tex-Mex, um, and in reference to the uh, Treaty of uh, 1848, which uh, is the birth of the Mexican-American. All Mexicans who decided to stay, uh, then were going to become Mexican-Americans. Those who did not want to stay, then stayed Mexicans and went back. And of course, they came back. <laughs> and this one is the white dotted distinction. Um, in Alice, the Alice uh, newspaper is called the Alice Daily Echo, uh, and it's about uh, me delivering the paper and seeing this ad uh, in a National Geographic, and it was, it was an, an ad for the uh, snorkel pen. Uh, it was a fancy pen, and I already was into writing, and, and, um, and so it's a poem about that. Uh, and then, uh, this is... Um, um, Nopalitos, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a poem about a mom uh, who used to live in the street that was uh, sort of like a dead end, and there was a little Montecito, a little wood, wood area, and, and mom during Lent would go there to, uh, we would go cut uh, nopales, uh, and, uh, which is the uh, Lenten uh, food. And uh, I'll read you this one, Nopalitos. I remember Lent. And when mother and I went to cut nopalitos from El Montecito down our street, she packs a large blade 
I take newspapers to wrap las cactus pads. As we enter a tangle of mesquites, we are startled by a gaunt Mexicanito eating tunas de nopal, hiding from la migra on his way to Houston to see his daughter. Mother tells him to wait. We return with a plate of flour tortillas, scrambled eggs, and frijolitos refritos. I remember Lent, nopalitos, y el mexicanito hiding in el montecito. That was my first encounter, because my parents were not, I had no connection with Mexico, you know, I'm very different in that sense. A lot of students that I teach and friends and so forth, uh, because both my mom and dad were born here, so, uh, and uh, being illiterate, and not doing a lot of history, I would always ask them, well, where do we come from there? But, you know, they, they didn't know. They, I think that one might told me uh, that the, he thought he came from Monterrey. But, uh, but uh, well, where is everybody buried there? I, I don't have a grandpa, I don't have a grandpa. And, uh, but um, uh, that was my first encounter with uh, someone from Mexico uh, hiding from the Border Patrol on the, uh, on the way to Houston. And I always wonder what happened to him. But my mom has such a big heart, and so she, uh, uh, she would say, wait here, uh, we're gonna go get food for you. And, uh, so I'll never forget that. Uh, yeah, so, and uh, whenever I read, I will always also say that uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and uh, every time I have, uh, when I can, a lot of times, it's a different type of program, but I always uh, uh, read a poem about uh, my mom and my dad. Because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. Because my mom, being totally illiterate, I have a poem called Mother Never Read to Me. Because one day it dawned on me that mom never read to me. And other kids would say, but their mom's never written to them. And it was the opposite. I would, read, I would bring books. I remember the Velveteen Rabbit. And she told me, uh, Lero, read it to me. But mom, you, you don't know English. No, but Lero, come again. So just read it anyway. So I would read to her instead of her reading to me. <laughs> and then when I did ask her, um, um, how come she didn't, you know, why she was a litter? She said, well, I never went to school. She was a sharecropper's daughter. And so they didn't believe in uh, the women, you know, so going, girls going to school. And, uh, and she, she gave me the first line of that poem because she said, no, 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 mijito. And she told me in English, but in English she said, the first time I ever saw the inside of the school was when I took you by the hand. Oh, oh And then so I wrote that poem. It's called, No Mother Never Read to Me. And then I, that's the first line. <laughs> uh, and this is about my dad. He was a fried cook, not a chef. He was very proud that he was just a fried cook, but the best. So the old dream oven. Father is the number one small town fry cook walking home from the late shift at the Palace Grill on <clears throat> Highway 281, escorted by a line of cats, stray cats, smelling the salmon croquettes, the jumbo shrimp that slept in the gulf just last night. Mm. Father is the number one small town fry cook coming home on callous feet, lugging a bucket full of day old donuts. But on cold December mornings, he rises early, rolls up a newspaper, strikes a match, and lights up the old dream oven. He is going to make pancakes. He's going to make the perfect pancake. He's going after the big one, the one that always gets away, the ultimate pancake. Without a mixer, he whips up the batter, just like a Hall of Fame kitchen jock he cannot stop. He makes stacks and stacks of pancakes. Despierten, ya están listos los pancakes. Come and get them. They're going. Hot cakes. <laughs> and this one is a memory of one day I was, going to, I was coming from Manai College and uh, the kitchen table was where I would do my homework and it was Saturday. And uh, he asked me, uh, get, us, get us one pancake. Do you want a pancake? And then I said, yeah. And so he made one and then and he put it in the plate. And I was ready to attack it. You know, I was always hungry. And he said, no, no, not yet. So he made another one, put it there, and I was ready to attack it. And he said, no, no, no. He made about 10 of them. And then he said, now that's a pancake. So he was teaching me a lesson, which I'll never forget, that if you're going to do anything, give the best you've got. And I think that the, if I have achieved anything in my life as a teacher 
or as a writer, it goes back to that pancake. Mm -hmm. When he told me, no, not yet. So he made like 10 or 12 of <laughs> And that's me um, back when um, I was in school. And because I, I didn't know English when I went to school, uh, I would, instead of saying library, I would say library. Uh, and so this is this one. I used to ask my elementary teacher, and of course I could not pronounce the, the uh, diphthong for the I, uh, because it doesn't exist in Spanish, I would say mis instead of miss. I would say mis, may I go to the library? And my teacher would tell me, Jesse, it's a library. Not library, but little Mexicanito me. <laughs> Love library. Because it rang with strawberry. <laughs> so I, know I was always hanging around. And then I've got a form of Avocado Avenue. Uh, and so uh, that's a little sample of my work. And, and now uh, Alisa Galvan uh, will share a little, like a little uh, information about Voices Cosmicas and uh, some, some of her work. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I love that library. Cause it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, I was teaching, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I teach at uh, San Francisco, and uh, a fellow uh, poet there, writer, uh, when you would write fault passes, the students ask fault passes to go to the library, and uh, he would write down uh, uh, where it says where they're going. He would write, he would write library, <laughs> and the librarian would get a get a kick of that. Um, I want to say yeah. that also your teacher was nicer than some of the other teachers were. Oh, yeah. oh yes, yeah. I'm going since um, but Mom was not here. He's the one that. Uh, invited us here because he was not able to be here today. Mm -hmm. So the first poem that I'm going to read is from his book, Red Accordion Blues. So Fernando is a musician. Um, mm -hmm. he, oh yeah, so I, I went through the book and I said, which one I'm going to like to read? And I said, okay, let's do this one. Let's do it, as they say. Wicked Woman at the Jalapeno Bar Blues. Wicked woman's got a look to wreck me, vex me, with a walk that licks the hot air like a tongue. Wicked woman's got a look to take me, shake me, boom, 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 like a drum beneath the jazz tune moon. Wicked woman's got a look, una mirada que se clava, that means a glance that will do you damn. Right between the eyes like a jealous lover's knife. Wicked woman's got a look to eat me, beat me. A voodoo hex to keep me, hanging like a gold charm round her hardest heart. Wicked woman's got a look. And it looks like seven years good luck. <laughs> That's Fernando. These are we we'll reading from the chat books that uh, were published by uh, when we do a reading of the Lascano Stan Library, now it's going to be Basan. But uh, the, except for the pandemic, uh, we read the book for the time. And um, I want to read one from Traficando. Um, I'm going to read this one. Because I, I, I chose to read this one, one of the ones, because life is so ephemeral. You know, it's, it's, it's like vapor, it's gone. It's gone. So it's in two parts. Ephemeral. The Buddhist meticulously pours out the sand on the ground, mixing each color slow and unhurried, until an image in his mind is transferred to the surface. Shapes are created in a line side by side. 
or merge one within the other. He does not look up around him, for to do so interrupts the stillness of his worship. Almost finished, he brings out colored rice, adding to the image almost completed. Then his hand reaches his gown one more time, and out comes delicate, minute flowers kept fresh by the love of what he's doing and wants to do. He says one more prayer as he lowers his head to bless his creation. Number two, the body artist selects the colors that will materialize from the drawings he has painted with his mind's eyes. A concept painstakingly drawn because his canvas is alive and breathing. And the body oils will intermingle with the palette he selects, brushed on delicately as a painting exquisite and rare porcelain. He paints and his canvas breathes in and out with each breaststroke. Color, skin, art, merge until the painting is completed. He stands back and lets the art fully come to life. Three, the rains come down on the Buddha's painting, erasing the image. The breathing art created by the body artist is bathed away by the rain and all colors pour into the river as offerings to the universe. Mm. Mm. I maybe have an old clock at my house. Or <laughs> yeah, me too. The old clock. The old clock in the corner softly clicks the seconds and minutes, tall and magisterial. In design. It leans against the walls for support because it's old. It leans against the walls for support. And times the daily activity of its owner, defining the atmosphere with its presence. It rolls around the clock. The person wants to capture time, time to finish tasks throughout the day, increasing their frenzied activity, trying to slow down the hands of the clock. An angry sigh fills the air. The sunrise chimes on the clock before settling on the face whose eyelids slowly begin to flutter. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told you once upon a time that you had no right to love. You know, you were a certain age and you couldn't do it. <laughs> and you know, oh, oh, oh my God, you know, or somebody says, oh, make you happy, babe. And then, but you got to give up everything you know. I have it bilingual, but I'm going to read the English, okay? If, because I love you now, does it mean that the past has to be relegated to a minor level permanently? If I love you, does it mean I had to relinquish my movie memories of old times, a sense of sounds that are embedded in me? Does it mean my body fragrance will change forever when blended with yours? Will I become an important essence in your life if I love you? Will it mean I have succumbed to optimism, wanting to have someone near me each day and night to warm the cold Arctic of my body? If I love you. <laughs> this was uh, the latest the chapbook that we, uh, Fernanda, um, asked us to print. And it was written in honor of a um, Salvadorian poet called Roque Antonio Dalton, and he's called Roque Dalton. He was a, a politician, uh, you know, in, in the 
the politics of South America are very irregular. But unfortunately, um, he helped those, and then the ones that he helped, they didn't make. And uh, he, uh, yeah. it's a tragic story. And again, it's bilingual, but I'll read the English. Interesting, interesting person. Um, and this is what life was then during the time that he could, when he all escape, just hide, you know, with, with his life. He can't go, how do you, how do, you do this? Okay, and I'm, the quote from one of his books uh, is, because with your face died in my hands, the old habit of forgetting. Broke it all, it is cold without you. Today's beauty still cannot erase the nightmares of yesterday. When they sought to crush my will and obey theirs, I close my eyes to imagine myself yours and that afternoon when the warmth of our bodies could not melt the iciness of their threats. We still had freedom to seek each other, define those walls with eyes and ears that saw and heard everything. And instead of listening to the politics, they were waiting for. There were in our bed poetic delights to feed the passion, disturbing their plan of discovering us and accusing us guilty of a crime. We felt on the skin promises of love despite anything they could do to us. They did, they mutilated by. Um, and I'm going to close with one. This is book, a book by Barrio Laredita, it's a Laredo woman, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's the uh, Si Plata Maria Sente. I translated her work, but she also asked me to write something about his grandmother, right over there was the Oscar grandmother, who was a grandmother. She had a third grade education. She went to Walmart White School in the, uh, in the mid 20s, early 20s and got certified as a registered midwife. Mm -hmm. And yes, and she wore her white thing. And she was, that was when home births were, you know, it's that. Uh, when the doctors, when war called, you know, the doc, they took all the doctors. That uh, The doctor, each doctor had, you know, the midwife, you know, like, uh, say, call you, I'm gonna call my child to come to you, that kind of stuff. So, um, I'm gonna read, again, I wrote, uh, in, Bilingual, but I'll read you one that because we're far around in Somerset, and I was as as, as, as the, since he was driving, I was thinking about her because they would call her. You know, we used to call them anyway, but she would come. She would, no matter. Mm -hmm. During the depression, there wasn't money to pay. You paid with what you had: food, orange, you know. And it's still, still, you, not that long ago, it's still true. Neighborhoods and hidden alleys. The economy is going from bad to worse, the depression. But we all work. My children sell newspapers and shine shoes. But I demand good grades at school. My dream is for them to go to college. All of my patients are poor and live humbly. They pay me with whatever they have, be it a hen, a basket of fruit, or simply with a recommendation with other women. From a little bit comes more. <laughs> I had patients on the streets of El Paso, San Luis, Monterrey, Guadalupe, Torreón, Chupaderas, Zarzamora, Quintana Road, when it was just a, like right now. Palo Alto, again, just that she used to maneuver all those in the dark. There are some women who work in the homes of very rich families. I attend to them in a small room where they live behind the main house. 
I advise you to stay in bed for a full day to give her body time to rest. On the third day, her mother comes and takes the baby because they will not let her have her children with them. It is, see, it is sad to see a mother separate from her child for days so they can survive. 